This video is supported by Amain Hobbies. Click the links in the description below. In this day and age, with the price of things going up thanks to, to a multitude of reasons I won't get into here, it makes more and more sense for those looking to get into racing to buy a budget racing rig, and manufacturers have started releasing a few budget versions of cars that can help get people into the racing world who may not be able to drop a solid grand into a shiny new race prep kit. I've already done a couple videos highlighting the costs of RC racing and very early on did a budget video on how to get into RC racing, but luckily a lot has changed since then. The options out there are many and in this video I'd like to highlight them. A few rules for this video. First, I was going to go over both 10th and 8th scale for this video but it ended up being longer than I anticipated, so for today, we'll only be going over 10th scale. Also, I won't be going over the slash in this particular video extensively but it will be mentioned a bit later along with some other options in that class. Also, I'd like to thank Aiming Hobbies for supporting this channel. In the description below, I listed all of the equipment I'm going to list in this video, along with a general link to the website. Anything you guys purchase will directly support me as well. Also, I'd like to take this time to remind you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and comment on ways you have saved money in the RC racing world. Without further delay, let's begin. Between 8th and 10th scale, 10th scale is probably the more budget friendly. Kits are cheaper, electronics are cheaper, tires are cheaper, and these days you don't need to have an entire hobby shop's worth of tires to be competitive. As a result, if you wanted to get into RC racing on a budget, and you had the option between 10th scale and 8th scale, 10th scale would be the way to go if you wanted to get your feet wet. With that being said, even 10th scale kits if you were to buy everything new can still cost a decent chunk of change. Take this for example, a mod 2 drive buggy. On screen right now are all the parts needed to complete this kit and how much each component cost. As you can see, nothing is really considered cheap in this hobby. Even what would be considered the cheapest class to race in. If you think you can cut down the cost on entry by running stock electronics, this kind of works but once you start to improve and want to become more competitive, things start to add up in terms of hop ups and upgrades to your car. From ceramic bearings, titanium screws, turnbuckles, puck systems, multiple fans, and the list goes on. In the end, a competitive mod car will be cheaper than a competitive stock car. With that out of the way, say you don't really want a car being care about it being 100% competitive and just want to drive around the track and have fun. Well, there are options for you in both the RTR and kit space. So let's start with RTRs. Starting off with something that's sure to get at least one person mildly annoyed, we have the Slash. The Slash is probably the most popular RC car in the modern world. It's literally everywhere. I'm going to be going over a design in more detail in the future for sure, but the long short of it is, regarding this regular Slash, it isn't set up for racing. It's set up to look scale when going around a parking lot or baseball field. What the Slash does have over RTRs is part support and the fact that a lot of places around the world have stock Slash classes. Mark San Maria already has a stock Slash series going around the country right now, so if you already have a Slash, don't feel intimidated by taking it to the racetrack and turning a few laps. There is, however, a Slash out there that can do decently well on the track, and that's the Slash Ultimate. Even though the price is steep initially, all you need to complete it is a battery and charger from Traxxas, which puts us well within the price of a new racing kit with all the electronics. The difference with this Slash is the fact that A, it's full drive, and B, it has a low center of gravity or LCG chassis. Because of this, it handles much better than a standard slash 4x4 by a long way. However, it's still quite on the expensive side, and if you're pretty much strong-armed into only using Traxxas stuff, Traxxas electronics and batteries specifically. 
which for racing isn't ideal. Luckily, there are better options out there that don't use extremely proprietary electronics, specifically from Associated. What you're seeing on screen right now is the Team Associated SE10 Pro 2. I'm aware that a new one is coming out very soon called the LT10SW, which is based on and compatible with newer model cars from Associated, including kits. But for now, we have the regular Pro 2 and Pro 4 short course trucks. Both of these trucks have a few different versions you can grab, most of which are cheaper than a regular Traxxas Slash and are all cheaper than buying a full blown racing short course truck like the Team Associated SC6.4 or the S-Ray SCX. Also, all come with 2.4 GHz radio systems. This one in particular comes with a charger and lipo as well, so if you wanted to get on the track as soon as possible, it's really hard to go wrong with this thing. Also, if short course truck isn't your thing and you want to go into buggy racing, there's also the RB10 RB or RTR from Associated that works pretty well as a stepping stone into a highly competitive world of buggy racing. Pretty much everything I said about the Pro 2 and Pro 4 SETs can be applied to the RB10 as well. Some honorable mentions for good RTR race trucks go to the Arma Sentin, both the two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive versions are basically better handling slashes, and they are much cheaper. Next up, we have the Low C22 SCT, a very good handling truck out of the box, but lacking in adjustability as well, with solid plastic camber links and such. With that out of the way, why don't we talk about the kit world? Very recently, there's been a resurgence of cheap kits coming from a few larger brands out there that are actively making an effort to actually bring costs down. Also, if you wanted to get into RC racing and ask me whether or not buying a kit would be worth it, 99% of the time I would say yes. By building a kit, you get a much better idea of how to work on it if something goes wrong, and you get a slightly better idea of what does what on the actual car, setup wise. Also, even though most kits not coming with electronics may be seen as a bad thing, it isn't as bad as you might think. Because in racing people like to use their own electronics anyway, if a kit came with electronics they would more than likely not be used and at worst be thrown away. This is why companies like Arma have just regular rollers in their lineup of cars. They know people are going to change out the electronics anyway so why bother? Speaking of rollers, that leads me to this thing right here. This is the TLR22 5.0 DC roller. Even though this buggy is a solid 5 years old now. It's still a very capable buggy with pretty good parts support, both OEM and aftermarket. Here's the thing though, I do think that TLR will be coming out with a new tool drive buggy soon enough. The reason I say this is for two reasons. For one, I see a lot of team drivers selling off their old kits and secondly, this troll of a post about the wait being over for a new website. Then again, those team drivers could just be making a move to another brand as a new buggy hasn't come out in a while and the post could be just that, a troll. Either way. The 22 5.0 roller is very much a good buggy that does very well on the track, and the only thing you need to do to get it going is to add your own electronics, which we'll get to in a bit. Now, if you really want to get a better idea of how RC cars work and want something cheap to run and build, then there are a few options out there for you, specifically four that I could find. Two of them would be considered retro style buggies and the other two would be considered more modern designs. Let's go over the retro designs first as those are cheaper. First, you have the Kyosho Dirtmaster and GeForce Genova. The Kyosho Dirtmaster is based off their old 5 series of off-road buggies back in the day, specifically the RB5 rear motor buggy with a few different parts here and there to modernize it. Luckily, what this means is that if you have an old RB5 or RB5 based car, like for example a front mounter, then that means that you can actually find parts for it again and run it confidently. Anyway, back to the Dirtmaster. It's still a decently capable buggy today and is able to keep up with the most sportsman level drivers in the right hands. The same thing could be said as well for the other buggy that recently came to my attention, the GeForce Genova. If you live in the United States, you've probably never heard of the GeForce before as a company, and I would be in the same boat. However, they are very popular outside of the US and are even used by top level drivers like Bruno Coelho. The Genova has the same, also has the name Masami Hirosaka tied to it. 
Apparently he did some design influence on it, but how much influence he actually had on the car is debatable. But we're not here to talk about the car's legacy. We're here what we want to know how it drives. Well, like the Dirt Master, pretty well when in the right hands. Unlike the Dirt Master though, it isn't based on a previous generation buggy of any sort. It's an all new design, which in theory would be good, but in practice it kind of isn't. This is pretty much entirely due to part support, but we'll get to that later. The point is, on an old school or even newer clay track, the Genova and Dirt Master both do well, but from a design standpoint, they can never really do as well as other modern designs. Which leads me to the next two cars I'm going to talk about. First of the pair would be this, the Yokomo SO Rookie, or a super off-road rookie. Now the Rookie is basically a toned down cheaper version of the old YZ2 Cal 3.1 and DTM 3.1 combined. Instead of aluminum or aluminium for the chassis and shocks, it's now plastic. Now this may seem like a huge downgrade over the $470 Super Off-Road 1.0 buggy, but trust me if you're just starting out, it really isn't. I've personally done very well with the Yokomo platform in the past. And if you're just starting out or on a tight budget and you want a modern design buggy that will work well on modern tracks, this is probably one of your best bets. The other good bet that I'd wager would be what you're actually seeing on screen right now. That being the Serpent SRX2 mid-motor. This is the cheapest kit racing buggy you can buy in the market today and once again in the right hands, it can perform extremely well on most surfaces. The footage you're seeing now is that of that buggy on an AstroTurf track and it's doing pretty well even with a camera on the way. Now, despite what you may think about me, I'm not completely oblivious to the elephant in the room when it comes to all four of these kit buggies I've mentioned so far, that being part support. Things may be different outside the US. I know Serpent and Yokomo are more popular outside of the States in particular, but since most of you are in the United States who are watching right now, I must say that it would not be wise to buy any of the buggies I mentioned prior if you want to continue running for a stretch of time. Mostly because most RC tracks in the country that I know of don't carry Yokomo, G4, Serpent, or even 10th scale Kyosho parts. So if you're going to have to buy something, you're going to have to buy them online. This leaves you with three options. Either run the car and hope nothing breaks, buy a decent amount of spare parts and then run it more comfortably, or bite the bullet and get a more expensive kit from a company that's more popular like Associated or Losi. If you're forced into door number three, don't worry. There are still ways to save money on electronics, and here are a few of them. Now why don't we go down the list of everything you're going to need to run a car and see how much you're actually going to need to outfit it to a decent spec. Starting with the motor. Now the motor is one of those things you can buy used pretty easily. Do a bit of searching on Facebook Marketplace and a few different RC buy and sell groups and you can easily find a good motor for over half off. Even if you buy new though, there are still options out there for you can buy for less than 100 bucks. So if you check out a few different brand lines for like the Bandit and Quick Run series for motors from Hobbywing or perhaps the Onisiki series of motors which are usually used for drifting, but I see no reason why they can't be used for racing as well. The same thing can be supplied to ESCs as well, but to even more benefit. However, for me, the best option for someone getting into RC racing world and you want an ESC that will handle mod motors, the Quick Run 120 amp ESC is by far your best bet for 50 bucks. 50 bucks for an ESC that can reliably handle motors down to 4.5 turns on 2S and is lightly programmable is a deal that's pretty damn hard to beat. The only thing I can say that is an issue with that ESC is that it isn't roar proof or blinky class, so don't try and run it in stock. Granted if you're on a budget, you're probably not running stock anyway. There are a few other options that are more race oriented with options from companies like Yeah Racing, Onisiki, and much more racing and are all good options that are roar proofed, save for the Onisiki. For servos, things can get a bit more tricky as in my personal experience, you really do not want to cheap out on a servo as having a bad servo can really hurt your driving. 
My classic standby for all my 10 scale racing rigs is the 1258TG from Savox. It's fast, strong, and most importantly, less than 100 bucks. There are still plenty of other options out there for this price range of 70 to 90 bucks, and like before, you can still buy stuff used no problem. So if you find a good deal on a CU servo that would normally be out of your price range, don't be afraid to check it out. Next up we have the batteries. Now this is something that I would be more wary about buying used, as taking care of a LiPo battery is extremely important to making sure they don't turn into surprise incendiary grenades from Gears of War. With that being said, I wouldn't go too cheap on the battery you intend to use as getting one that isn't well constructed could also lead to surprise combustion. In a more practical sense, I would recommend buying a battery with either 4mm or more preferably 5mm bullet connectors and soldering them directly to the ESC. I made a video a while back on how to look for in a battery, but for me, these Gen Zace 130C 4000mAh batteries are 5 bucks or 50 bucks each and work pretty well. There are also these Protec batteries and Reedy batteries for this price range too. The last two pieces of equipment we're going to need for this video will be the transponder to count laps. There's no real way to get out of this expense as they aren't going to be much less than 90 bucks if you need one used. And the receiver. Now, which brand you go for in terms of your receiver and radio combo really depends on your budget. And since this is a video about being budget friendly, the best brands you're probably going to want to go for will be Futaba, Flysky, and Spectrum. More so Flysky if you happen to buy a Noble MB4, which if you're on a budget, I think you should. If you don't fancy Flysky, you can also grab something like the Spectrum DX5 Rudging, which I think is much better for kids or clumsy adults. Just keep in mind you'll be spending more for receivers if you go with Spectrum or Futaba. Now, if we were to add up everything we put into this car, not including a charger, which I'll get to in the next part, we end up with a car that costs less than a grand. If you'd like to buy anything I mentioned in this video, feel free to check any of the links in the description below, as anything you buy from those links will directly help me as well. We will continue this two-part series sometime in the near future when my next 8 skill project comes into fruition. If you liked the video, or found it helpful, be sure to share it with someone you think might need it. Also, if you like my content, feel free to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And lastly, if you want to support me further, you can subscribe to my Patreon, where I post updates behind the scenes and teasers on when my next videos will come out. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Michael Williams, RC Coral Discord server, Casey Nix, Ben Reeves, Dave Armstrong, Joe Jenkins, Rob Bettingfield, Caden Merckx, Ron Chang, Ian Petrie, Keith McDonald, and especially Morrison Watt. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.